Welcome to the Voodoo Power Podcast. Welcome to Plates and Pancakes. We're sitting down today with Tony Villani. Coach Villani is the owner of XPE Sports, along with being the inventor of the shred mill. Villani interned with the NHL's Washington Capitals and was set to help the Washington Wizards prior to the NBA lockout. From Washington, D.C., Coach Villani moved to Orlando, where he assisted the head strength coach of the Orlando Magic for a basketball season. Coach Villani was the director of human performance at Chris Carter's FAST program. While at FAST, he focused on sports-specific speed, agility, and strength training. He helped prepare numerous NFL combine athletes and professional athletes from all sports. Villani started his education at Clemson University in South Carolina and attended graduate school at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He received a master's degree in exercise physiology and graduated in the top of his class. His thesis was published by the European Journal of Applied Physiology and dealt with the benefits of exhaustive interval training. Coach Villani has one of the most impressive clientele lists in the world, along with some of the fastest 40-yard times in combine history. So welcome to the show, Coach. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate you for having me on. I guess I've been in the business a long time. I haven't realized all that. So. Well, you've, do, you've done a lot of incredible things, so it's an honor to have you on. <laughs> Again, thank you. So Just been working. So looking back kind of at your basketball days and knowing what you know now in the feet, if you could have cleaned the feet up in basketball, do you think you could have had as big of an impact there as what you've had in football? Yeah, I, basketball was my first love. Like, that's what I grew up playing. I wanted to work for an NBA team. It's just they were way behind, I think, on the speed and agility kick, really having uh, – impact on your sport and i get it like if you get faster more powerful quicker at football you're gonna become a better player so people are always like why did you focus on football and i didn't choose to it's just that was a sport that deemed what i knew as real important uh with the magic i i, I wish i would have known what i did now and being able to stay in basketball just uh ability to cross over, the ability of force production into the court, the ability of rapid contacts on and off the court, um, the ability of ankle stiffness, RSI. I wish I would have known that because I would have applied it even more than just like some strength and conditioning stuff I learned at GW trying to transfer it to basketball. Now in football, the closer the ball, the less they have to run, the more explosive and stronger they have to be, the further away from the ball, the faster they have to be. Your linemen and your big guys, you know, I know we we talk a lot of routes and stuff like that in these clinics and all that. How important is top speed or getting to top speed going to be for them guys closer to the ball? I think the ability to rapidly accelerate, and this gets me in trouble, is more important to what top speed you can hit on football, especially. Um, Now, people argue with me about the max reserve effect and, you know, if you can have a high max speed, it helps your acceleration. I I don't believe the max reserve effect says that. And after talking to people that kind of coined it, they don't either. The max reserve effect is really relegated for track. And the higher you increase your max speed, the higher it is to run fast at perceived lower intensities. I, I agree with that in the max reserve effect. But saying that if I increase my max V, my acceleration curve, is going to increase. Yeah, your acceleration curve is going to increase and stay in acceleration longer. I, I hammer acceleration and it has really helped everyone even in the 40. Uh, so when people want to argue with me about it, I'm fine with that. I understand where they're coming from but e- on distances as short as 40 yard dash, I don't think Max V has much um, determination. People can say I'm wrong but no, no, I hammer acceleration. So when you take the 40 and we're reaching speeds of 23, 24 miles an hour to run fast, and on the field you only need 21 or 22 to be fast, um, I still hammer acceleration because with those first initial pushes, an athlete can reach 75% of their max speed. So a lineman whose max speed is 18 or 19 on a 40, if he pushes off the ground, he's going to get to 12 or 13 in two, three steps. That's the speed he accelerates. That, that, that's fast. So we hammer force and rapid acceleration uh, with everyone, including linemen, and just know that the receivers and DBs, because of their position and they have space to run longer, will reach a higher top speed and their body weight's lighter. 
nothing to do with they don't have increased force production as the, the O lineman. They don't they they probably may have increased force production for body weight, but not increased force production. They have space on the outside and time of the play that allows them to get the speed. So linemen, we hammer acceleration, hip mobility, wide foot placement, like stay in wide foot placement. I don't think that's stressed enough. Like let's work on on agility and quick foot drills or whatever. Like, no, they need to hunker their feet down and be in a wide base on every drill they do. So we do a lot of mobility. I call it wide based foot placement drills and just being powerful with their steps on when they jab out or cross out of, let's say. You kind of share the duties of strength training and you, and you have help there. And obviously you guys are doing amazing work. So when you're building that lineman, you're building that wide base, will you, will you stick with some sumo pulls and some wide stance box squats? What are you kind of looking to, to build that outside of the hip? Yeah. I mean, I'm not that great uh, at weight training. Um, I make sure our weight training doesn't mess up our movement training. And I think that's what helped me get fast and athletic guys um, before or like just move my curve to happen sooner than others. Because I believe in a weight training. I believe in power training, but I also believed in what people are doing now. Jump, sprint, then lift or learn how to superset them together. And when one falters, they all falter. So I, for our linemen, I mean, I still love doing single leg stuff with our linemen because they're of, of knee health, you know? And yeah, I would definitely love to do sumo squats with them. Um, but I wouldn't treat them that much different because I'm trying to treat them as an athlete, me. And then I say, go get ugly with your position coach. Go get ugly under that clean bar, whatever our weight training program guy has programmed for you. Go go scream over there and do your five reps. But like, I'm just going to look at what you're doing and make sure that it's helping our movement and not hurting. Now, going back just a little bit, we were at the NHS SCA mm-hmm. NatCon here a while back. We got to talk. I was taking notes to your presentation. So that's where some of these questions come from. Yeah. But uh, in that, you said force production is the goal. Ground contact time has little to do with it. Um, as ground contact time increases, ground force production has to increase. So building that hard first step is that, I know that's kind of yeah. where you come up with the shred mill. Yeah. Well, how, speed, how are you getting that built? Yeah, go Sorry, coach. How are you getting that built? No, the shred mill built or how we're no, building that power or that the power, power built, right? Yeah. The power. So what I'm, kind of meant is you know your first initial steps you're using the ground to push off right and i think force is king and don't stay on the ground as long as possible but you do keep your push let me say i want you to push off the ground as long as possible but do it as rapidly as possible right and when you eliminate when you take away that ground contact at the beginning you eliminate the momentum effect of your horizontal projection let's say, not trying to get scientific, right? So we tell our guys is find force first. Let's learn how to keep your foot on the ground and push and hit the ground and push again. And if you can push another time, push again. And if you can, out of a 40-yard dash, get three, four to five pushes in, you're shooting into 20, 22 miles an hour, right? If you don't have the power to push your body weight horizontally more than three to five steps, you're going to pop up too soon and you're going to die out speed so it's always fine for us first so we try to teach elongated ground contact time which is weird for increased push while we're supersetting that with heavy leg training or heavy acceleration dose because they all correlate heavy leg training is using the ground heavy acceleration doses using the ground deload and do it with free run use the ground to project and we tell our guys, we want them to look like missiles and everybody to look like dang, he was running, but we want their head to feel like they weren't running at all. They were only pushing. And after we get that push and horizontal force, then we start worrying about simply knee switching or frequency, right? But we say, don't knee switch if you haven't finished your push, right? And that's where speed gets complicated because everything's a ratio you can push too long and knee switch too slow you can knee switch too fast and push too light like that's where it gets hard 
where everyone's looking for the ultimate, I guess, ratio, I guess. But I'm like, is finding the ultimate ratio on a video analysis and showing it to an athlete, what is the time it's going to take that athlete to really learn that? Maybe they can in track. With our combine athletes, we don't do it. We teach them horizontal projection with power for four weeks. And when we start to deload them, we teach them horizontal projection with power, knee switch into running. And they tell me, when does my head come up? When am I done pushing? I said, when you feel like you have to run to catch up. That's it. I mean, it's we make it, I think, simpler than most. And I think we're lucky and have picked some good things to target that have worked. That makes sense. And I had a question in there on that. So this actually works really good. You're talking about, you know, projection, forward projection, not coming up too soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, forward can mean a lot of different things. But through my career, learning what forward meant to me was everything's moving in the direction you want to go. Not excess knee height, not all that. And you get into Dr. Yeses' stuff and he starts talking about knee projection and how important that is in pullbacks. So I know you had the Bruce Lee drill on your XPE. Are, do you find that if you get that heel up underneath the butt more, you get more forward knee projection? Um, I don't know. I We try to teach them to keep their heels down. I mean, we don't teach them to drag their toe, but we teach them to push off so hard. Everything's an action reaction. So if the front leg finishes the push and you really get toe off, then that back toe is going to drag a little bit only because you push so hard. So I think people are always like, well, toe drag or not toe drag. I'm like, just effing push. If it drags, you pushed. If it doesn't drag and it stays low, you push. Just push. So we don't teach the heel up, the, the, that heel cycle, until we, until we tell them they're riding a bike and gearing up. So we, I always tell the guys, when you were a young kid and you raised people on a bike, the first thing you did was stood up on the bike and push the pedals. Okay, well, that's what you do out of a 40-yard start or out of a split stance. You sit low and you push the pedal. You push the ground. And then you sit down and create circles and ride a bike to maintain your speed, not to build it, to maintain it. And if you're lucky, you have a 10-speed bike and you can gear shift and get that circle bigger and bigger while it stays fast and increase your stride length. Right. So using that bike analogy of pushing the pedals first and not worrying about cycling them and cycling them second, while that circle is getting bigger and staying fast, third is the best analogy I've done to train athletes. And when they do that for 40 yards, that you snap your finger and they're done. So we tell them explode, create force, find some form, and you should be done. You know? Now, Noah Lyles and those guys in track, I mean, that's about reaching speeds that are that are 100% of your max V and how long you hold into it. So ground contact times and getting off that track in 0.80 seconds or less, and I've just learned about this the last year and a half, is so important for that, for that 100-meter dash. People can argue with me and say it's real important for improving your acceleration zone of the 40-yard dash. And I will just politely understand why they have that information and disagree with them because we've never done it. Now, do we do pogo hop? Sure. We, I mean, do we target it? Do we sprint? Uh, less than people think. We find ways to produce high intensity, forceful accelerations until we can't anymore that day. It's not a lot. And we rest for two days and do it again. And we do that for six weeks. Then we deload and let them sprint and they're, normally the fastest on the planet. Now you brought something up in there and I had the question on this and I don't remember if it was XPE that you said it or where else I'd heard you say it. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of sounded like once you had your combine guys peaked, they were two weeks out from the combine and they were just kind of coasting in. Uh, yeah. And, and I think so, you made the reference, that's the biggest day of their life, and, and they're peaked two weeks out. They just have to trust the process. Yeah, so we stop any type of overloading two weeks out. So they have gone through the training. We have mostly just hammered acceleration in the legs two days together. I mean, our blanket program is followed by 80 to 85% 
of our combine athletes. We try to, this guy needs to be more forceful at the beginning. This guy needs to build acceleration longer. This guy needs to build his max D ceiling higher. Like we try to maybe target something extra 10 to 15% on the guys, but not much. And people don't understand, believe me. Um, but we go through a four to five week overload phase. And then about two weeks out from Indy, all we do is deload them and let them run 40s. So that's it. And we the, the work is done. The work is done. They're running their best times two weeks out. And all we're trying to do is just let them run fast on fast legs so they don't pull hamstrings at the combine. Because at the combine, if you do your job, they've set a PR there that they've never set in their life which means their muscles are more rested than they've ever been in their life. And they're producing more force and central nervous system recruitment than they've ever produced in their life. You know? So for that last two weeks, we just get them used to running that fast. And um, not a lot of running. We'll do 240s one Thursday, 240s the next Thursday, and then they're running the following Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, or Saturday. That's it. And people are like, how many 40s do you run? Four, two, two, two weeks out, two, one week out. That's it. Now, like, what do you spend the rest of the time on? Monday, hammering legs and three steps of power. Thursdays, hammering legs and five to eight steps of power into transition. That's it. That's it. That's our script. People don't believe it until they've come and seen it. And then they realize, oh, I can do this. Yeah, I think we just pick some right things to focus on and it work. Talking about that in there, there was another question I had on that. Cause you were, you were talking down there and one hard step equals five to seven yards is kind of what you, what you were discussing. So that was, yeah. would have been my question. If you know, you're going to run the 40, are you looking at seven to eight steps of acceleration? Is that kind of where you're wanting your guys to be? Does that even out? I, I say once, if you go through explode and push off the ground, three steps, like explode and push, 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 and then let your run happen and just find form. I say call it fine form, like heels start coming up, knees start coming up, chest start, like let the circle underneath you lift you, not you lift up your circles, I say it. They're like, when do I pick up my chest? I said, when you want to. Your body's pretty amazing. We only had four to six weeks with you. Like project yourself out and catch up to yourself, right? Find force, push off the ground, find form. It'll be over. So it'll be over. We don't like really coach the steps as much as find force, push, open up, you'll be done. Um, now with the game speed stuff, and that's why if you teach an athlete to truly explode and push the ground once, twice, three times, he can't stop until he's 18 yards down there. I mean, he truly can't because he's reached a speed of 14, 15 miles an hour the first five yards. Even in his movement, he's going to start getting up. And by the time he puts on his brakes, he'll be about 13, 14 yards down there. So that's why when we say, hey, if we're changing receivers Anquan Bolden taught it to me it, 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 it's ingenious if you're running a dig post or post corner you push off the ground three steps and you just use momentum to ride a bike and hold your speed but not try to turn over your speed right because you're going to be going too fast like you're running a 40 so we call that just riding a bike and maintaining your speed great receivers are circling but they're not picking up speed because if they pick up too much speed after those three steps they're at a rate of speed that's too high to change directions at 15 yards. So the great receivers may push three times for their routes they're running at 15 yards. They may push two times for the routes they're running at 10 to 12 yards. They'll only push one time, one step of speed. And if they go two, three, they go slant. If they go two, three, four, five, six, they go speed out. But they're only pushing one step of speed on those. So the whole misconception is that receivers that run routes fast run three steps and do a slant, run six steps and change direction. No, they're literally sh only using one, two, or three steps of speed and showing speed the rest of the time so they're in a good position to set up their routes. And it's not just with receivers. I learned it because I worked with some great receivers. On, we're teaching them speed and agility when they knew how to run routes well. This is for any sport that has a planned attack mode in their system. A soccer goal a lacrosse goal is where you know you're going. The defender knows you're going there. You have to be able to move your defender one way and change directions on them. That's exactly what a receiver is doing to a DB. I always hate it when people are like, 
was your stuff football specific? I'm like, tell me one person on the earth that's not better than a wide receiver at having a predetermined spot that he has to go to and he still has to get there. Okay. So I want to learn from that guy. Now the defense, the back, tell me one person in the world that has one job to play defense and take the best player in the world away from that spot. I want to learn that. So if I play soccer, I got to learn both of those. Whereas the receiver just learns one, learn one. That's why he's the best in the world at it. The DB just learns one. But basketball, lacrosse, soccer, all those sports, they have to learn offenses and defensive principles, I call them, that football players are better than anyone in the world at. Another way you can look at it on the basketball court is Luka Doncic, right? When he gets one step of separation on you, he does not start taking off to that hoop. He waits and brings that guy back in. He's playing big man receiver ball. I'm going to bring the guy to me, just like a big receiver is bringing the DB to him because then the, the receiver is going to separate from him, and so is Luka. So Luka plays big man receiver ball. And people are like, how does he keep getting a shot off? How does he keep getting so open? He's playing big man Chris Carter, Larry Fitzgerald, Anquan Bolden. He's playing big man receiver ball. You know, or someone like Allen Iverson is playing little man receiver ball, right? Where I've got to show you a lot of motion, a lot of stuff. I've got to get you moving to get by you because I can't use leverage. And when I get by you, I'm going 100 miles an hour to the hoop. But both Iverson and Kobe and Jordan was a master at it. We'll say all said the same thing. I didn't learn to play basketball until I slowed down. And that's what Anquan Bolden and Chris Carter and they all taught me, teach our receivers. And that's actually what Reeves taught me. Teach me to slow down. Teach me how to not run to guard a route. I'm like, huh? He goes, the more I can play basketball and being a defense and feel like I'm guarding the guy, the better I am. I'm like, that's an amazing statement. Let's go. And it just opened up my eyes to the relationship between speed and agility and offense and defense. Way back when when I'd first kind of stumbled on this through different coaches I was talking to, I listened to some podcasts thinking, wouldn't it be great to be able to have you on a podcast? And here we are. But you were talking about working through simple aspects that just get overlooked. Don't get coached. Don't. And I'm like, it can't be that simple. It, and then I watched you down in Texas. So learning to take this complicated idea that should have never got that complicated and bring it back to just the feet. Let's just fix the feet. When did that take on such importance? It's when everyone was using the dang footwork ladder that got such a bad rap and dancing around footwork ladders and cones and all that stuff. And I'd love to use the footwork ladder for teaching foot placement and where our feet are set coming out of different positions to create acceleration. So I coined this thing like where it was. It was uh, slow feet don't eat. You know, fast feet eat. And I tell people fast feet don't eat. Because fast feet through that ladder are teaching you to stay in place. Right? But foot placement in that ladder that teaches you to accelerate after you come out of the ladder are where, you know, I came up with. I only use four ladder drills. It's straight through, lateral through, icky through, or start and stop. That's it. But there's <laughs> so many different ways to come out at different angles based on each one of those four. So, like, everybody's like, oh, you believe in the footwork ladder, you do all the... No, 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 no. I believe in foot. I believe in four basic movements. Straight ahead, lateral, shifting side to side, and starting back. That's it. Those are the only four movements. So, I only got four ladder drills I do. But we work on the foot placement of turning the toe this way, leaking it this way, sitting in a watt. We work on the foot placement and body position coming out of each of those. And people would use it more, not just the ladder, but Anything, if they realized what getting one step ahead means. Okay, so you, everyone saw the 100-meter race. If if Noah Lyles or any one of those guys in the 100-meter race got one step in before everybody else, they won the gold, and they're running 100 meters. It's who, If somebody got one step ahead and then everybody started, it's called a far start by hundreds for a second, but they would get one and a half tenths ahead of someone, and they'd never get caught. They would win the gold. Now we're dealing with 40 yards or 20 yards or 10 yards. We're dealing with far less time that speed can make up a mistake of an immediate acceleration. 
So the immediate acceleration in Trump's speed, sorry people, 100% of the time almost. Because speed can't make it at up in enough time before the play's over. Will speed make it up on a track? One full step? You better be a lot faster than a guy. Right? Okay? And that's 100 meters. So when Revis, and I keep quoting Revis and Anquan Bolton because I had them alone in my facility for eight straight weeks preparing Revis for the last season. And I had trained great Roger receivers before. I learned how they did it. And I had trained some great DBs to be fast, and they were great in the NFL. But I never had a guy like Revis come give me confidence. Like, man, these drills are, are correct. Make sure I'm doing them right. You doing them right? Okay, you did that wrong. We tried to get our foot in tight so we could get back here. And you kind of got outside your position and dropped your foot underneath you. He's like, yeah. He's like, that's the difference of a pick six and not. I'm like, it is. Because it's you missed the step. And that's what Revis and Anquan and those great players knew before any of this GPS data came out, before any of it. They knew to play the game between 14 and 18 miles an hour maximum, but to be able to change directions within that zone better than anyone. Okay? And by doing that, they get two to three tenths, not hundreds, ahead of everyone by their change of direction. And so we tell our football players, what's the most important change of direction? My guys know. The first the first one is the only one. Yeah, if you missed that first one, you may have missed a touchdown. You may have missed a pick six. You may have missed a get open. What's the second most important one? The second one, if I have a chance, Tony. Yep. And what do you normally don't have? I don't get three separate. I don't get three change of directions, right? Sometimes you do, and it's a highlight because somebody changed directions three times. And normally, then it's it plays done. So, um, if they, the the foot position, the body position, the game speed you're carrying into it, um, is so much more important. And then force production, um, because everybody works on the force production of horizontal force. Love Les Feldman, love track. I love it. Force production, force production, force production. Okay, once when I move, and now there's a lot of ways my body's gonna stop that I gotta refine force production. That that's what I think is missing. On a lot of people, and that's why I made my curriculum ten bucks a month. So you can't art. You can just you could watch all fifteen hours for ten bucks and ask me for your money back, and I'll give it to you. Like I didn't create this twenty year of life experience in fifteen hours and all these videos for ten bucks a month to get rich. I did it so it would open people's eyes to say, if "I train speed and do it well. I got a lot of free time to work on the other stuff." I know we've discussed this, but I I always tie in horses somewhere along the way but man you would have been a heck of a cow horse guy because the, <laughs> the two things you said there I, i've got to ride with buck brandon and i got to ride with peter campbell i got to listen to ray hunt talk i mean just some of the greats and they always wanted to know where the feet were and they always wanted to know where the sag was if, if there was a sag in the neck now he can't get across because there's a bow in his neck and it's in his way listening to you talk about these athletes you're looking at the same way where are your feet and how can you come out and go where you want to go. It's so cool. Like when you run and have to attack a 45 degree angle, the new thing is you shift your head way to the right and then you plant and come back to the left. And you're shifting your head way to the right. It's called a rocker step, trying to get that person to move off a spot. And I tell our guys, all right, you want to do that rocker step? You better hope you don't go against fucking Revis or Stefan Gilmore because they're you're dead. You're dead. Because they're going to look at your rocker step, and if they don't turn their hips, you're going to come back and plant right back to where your body started. And that's the same thing as that horse said. So, like, I'm not saying it's bad to do a rocker step. Do it. But you better make sure they went for it. Because if they don't, you've given that defender an opportunity to get in front of you. So the head is like, it all starts. The head, the eyes. like It's, it's, it's body position. It's it's everything. And, and, and we go through all this speed training and teaching people this 40-yard start of which we barely teach their 40 yard start that people don't believe us. We brush up on that the last 10 days, you know, but we, we go over on how to start a 40 all the time. And then they get to us for sports and we're like, okay, we're not going to do that anymore because that starts not applicable to sports anymore. But then they don't take the, the change that I made, not saying I'm right and say, now I'm going to teach you to accelerate from a bunch of different positions that are going to happen on. 
you know, and not to, not to shoot anyone in the foot. Running cars doesn't do it. <laughs> like, like we're not NASCARs, you know. It's it's better than just always running straight. But become an F1 car, and I would even argue I would take F1 cars over drag race cars, 100 meter sprinters, and NASCARs 200, 400 meter sprinters 100 percent of the time, and most people would in field sports. So now let's work out what look at a NASCAR move. That's how our training has to look. It looks like, I mean, a F1 car. It's got to look like an F1 car. And I would go back to your lineman and I'd say, I want to look like a bumper car just creating little leverage and teaching people to spin out in, in F1 cars. And I would even say my receivers are going to be better off or as beneficial as training as bumper cars as drag race cars. And that will get me in trouble because I'm not saying don't train speed i'm saying train like a drag race car to make them fast but make sure you address being a bumper car too you know because if you don't address being a bumper car how to get leverage and move inside and outside leverage on someone you're in trouble we had a short discussion there before we were walking back into the campus but uh the importance of eccentrics and the importance of being able to stop i kind of stumbled on it I, i talked to you about it and you reaffirmed it and then some other guys but uh let's say you're working on flying tens if you set a hard stop up at the end of that flying 10, start with a five yard. Athletes get faster if they can make that stop. Why do you think that is? I think it's the whole thing. Dan Victor, I mean, he's not the only one that's done it, but just proving the depth drops and how much force you can absorb is going to shut down some sensors and let you jump higher, right? I think it's the same with deceleration. When you teach someone that they can sprint fast and stop, I think it unleashes their body to push harder. They feel the less threat of sprinting. So I, I think it's the same thing. Um, if your body knows it can stop, it will run faster. Okay. Now, I would never um, test that on a track athlete, right? I don't want to mess up any track athletes. Say, hey, let's train your deceleration and see if your acceleration improves, right? But me and many others have found if you stress deceleration, there's those five to 10 fly times improve and you, you haven't even touched on it. I, I get texts and calls all day from coach coach. You wouldn't believe it doing your game speed stuff. We did five, 10 flies. We haven't worked on five, 10 flies in a, in a long time. We've just been running, stopping today. We did five, 10 flies the other day. And you know, out of 20 guys, we had eight PRs. I'm like, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know. I can't explain it besides they, they trusted themselves to stop. So they just started sprinting faster. I don't know. Okay, we talked about curve sprinting there just a little bit, and you yep. know, it, it, yep. it, we didn't touch on it hard. But I wonder, if through all the forwardness we've been talking, and the extra steps and the shuffle steps, if you worked on curve sprinting and you just got your athlete to stay forward and not let the arc jack with their feet, mm-hmm. would would you come out of that better? I don't know. I'm not. I'm unfortunately. I'm not saying I'm not a fan of curved running. I don't have time to do it. Um, with, um, we do sprint training and get our sprint doses in shout out to Tony holler. People think I hate him, love him, talk to him all the time. It just, it takes less training than you think to get fast, which is what he promotes. And we spend so much of our time on being F1 cars. I, I, I'm bad. Like I don't teach NASCAR runs. I don't do the curve running that everybody's doing. Um, as much as others do and not saying it's wrong. I just, you know, find like other things that I think our athletes need to work on. If that makes sense. Well, let's touch on what you were talking about there earlier, a step, a step is a 10th and a step equals three foot. That's what Sue Inquist used to say when she went on her run with the UCLA softball team. If, if we can, if we can get that three foot, we're going to change the game. That's kind of what you're saying. If you can get three foot on your opponent, he is not going to catch you. When did that start uh, resonating? Uh, so we had Revis and Anquan were talking about it, and we had these lights in our building. This this track girl created, and she had this big dream of put lighting up a track, and you just set how there was a light every foot, and you just set what speed you wanted the lights to go around. Right, so it was supposed to pace four hundred meter spinners, two hundred, hundred. But she went out of business because it was so expensive. But we had a 40-yard a strip, but then I had two facilities. So I gave one to Matt Gates and one to me. So I had a 20-yard strip. 
And all I did with the 20 yard strip was put the lights at 14 miles an hour. That's it. 14 miles an hour. Now all I had elite athletes in there, like top receivers and DBs. So you can start the lights whenever you want it. So I would say, I said, I know these DBs are going to react so quick, so much faster than their receivers because these DBs are just got the best reaction time ever. So I said, guys, go stand. Like the strip of lights is just going 20 yards in a straight line. I said, go put your front foot right by those lights. Right when I hit this button, doom, those lights are going to go doom, at 14 miles an hour only. How many NFL DBs do you think caught 14 miles an hour in 20 yards? Not one. And I was like, you guys, that light staying at 14 miles an hour, it's not even going 14, 16, 18, 20. It's only at 14 miles an hour. And it was, we couldn't catch it in 20 yards. And we can't get out on it. So then I said, all right, back away from that light one step. Now, I'm not going to start the light. Oh, no, no. Stay on the light. Now, I'm going to start the light when I see you move like a hand start on a 40. Right? Now, we're moving basically at the same time, but you had the little reaction. The light didn't have the reaction. You got the reaction. They'd catch it in five to seven yards. Five to seven yards. Because they would get to 14, my guys would get to 14 miles an hour, like in four yards. And then they'd get 16, 17 and catch it within five to seven yards, right? And then I was like, dang. So one step, one blink of an eye means it's going to cost us over 25 yards of space. Now, everybody thinks they make up that blink of an eye. And I'm like, you can't even make it up against an athlete that stays at 14 miles an hour. What happens when that athlete's not running at 14, right? So then I'd say, okay, well, now back up a step. So I call reacting to 14 miles an hour, which is slow. You can't make it up in 20 to 25 yards. I said, reacting at the same time of 14 miles an hour. Or 14 miles reacting at the same time as you, you can make it in five to seven yards. So knowing your playbook and where you're supposed to be is worth over 25 yards of space on the field. Okay? So ball coaches love hearing you. You got my guys to buy into listening to film study, right? Now I say anticipation is different than reaction. Back away from that light one step, three feet. And I'm going to start the light when your first foot steps. So you anticipated their movement. They were within one to, they caught it in one to two yards, right? So when those lights and we were using it, I was like, oh my God, like Revis and Anquan are right. Whoever gets that step wins, right? So then we started like showing it the one step test. So I would take a 5040 versus a 4440. And if that 5040 is one step ahead, meaning I put the 50 back foot on the one yard line and front foot on the two yard line. And I put the fast 4-4 guy on the goal line. So there's one step between their first and back foot, right? One yard. And I say, look, this is the slowest guy on the field you'll ever chase. When he takes off, you're going to catch him. Yes. So that's another thing. I let that. There's a reaction time in there, right? But this guy is, no offense, he's fat. He's 300 pounds. He runs a 5-0. When do you catch him? I don't care if you're Denzel Ward like we did it to. I don't care if you're Patrick Sertain Jr. like we did it. I don't care who you do it to. They all say, I'm catching that fat guy like right there at five to seven yards. Now, when you ask someone who's done the test, and now Denzel Ward's won them, when does he catch him? Not for 30 yards, Tony. Go ahead and show him. Right? They don't catch him for 30 yards. It takes, like, I don't make them touch him. They got to close the one yard space. All right? So it's like, and that's what bothered me is why am I taking all these guys from 460 to 442 if it really doesn't effing matter? Now, that's when people think that me and Holler disagree because he's like a tide is a, a speed's a tide to lift all boats. I'm like, I agree, man. 442 is always better than 460. But let's just add a but to that. It's a tide that lifts all bo boats if you adequately address their agility too. Right? And that is what playing fast is. Everybody thinks people that play fast change directions at a faster pace closer to their 40 than not. They don't. They actually play slower than you think. They just get open and, sh and, and, and anticipate and change directions better than you think. I had to train Stefan Gilmore. I mean, I loved it. Like, I trained, Re I trained Gilmore getting ready for the combine and first four years in the NFL. Then he went off, bought a big house in Charlotte. Now he's back in Florida. So I trained him and his little brothers in the NFL. 
But I hadn't seen Gilmore for four years. And in that meantime, I'd seen trained Revis and I saw Revis on Twitter anoint Gilmore as the goat. And I like at the best of the time, I was like, so cool, man. I was like, really, really neat. But I hadn't trained Gilmore. And Gilmore came back through our facility two years ago. I said, man, I got to go through some of this new stuff with you that I've been picking Revis' brain because I really didn't know it when I was training you. We were teaching speed one day, agility another day. Now we treat speed and agility on the same day and all agility the next day because it's so important. He goes, yeah, he goes, the game really slows down when you slow down, okay? And that just doesn't mean your mind and your eyes. And it means when you have enough confidence to slow down, not sprint, the game slows down. If not, you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, pulling those hips up underneath you, working on low ground contact times, working on looking straight forward, working on pumping your arms. All the stuff sprinters are supposed to do is everything you shouldn't do because you're out of control on the football team. Okay. Now, do you turn into a sprinter? Yes. One to 2% of the time. Okay. One to 2% of the time, you will be at speeds over 19 miles an hour if you're a 22 mile an hour athlete. 98% of the time, you're going to be between 14 to 18 miles an hour or less, even less. So that's what we started to train. People called me anti-speed. I'm like, I'm far from anti-speed. Check out the 40 results. But I do know when speed has its limitations and we need to focus on something else. If you think about it like a car, you got to go a certain speed to make the turn. It doesn't matter if you're what you're in. Now, some sports cars can handle that turn a little better than other yeah. cars, but you're going to roll the car if you don't get to the speed you have to be at to make the turn. Yeah, what do you wear in Florida? What do you do to run away from an alligator? Run zigzags. Why? He's honestly built like a drag race car. Short everything and <laughs> tires right underneath him. He can't change directions. Drag race cars can't change directions. That's why you want a sprinter. Vertical bounce and horizontal force and never changing directions. Like I, me personally, do not want to teach my athletes that. And that's where I get bashed when I'm like, I'm not saying don't focus on it for like in Tony Holler agrees. Don't I'm not saying don't focus on it on 20 minutes on, on Monday, Thursday. But if I got two hours a day with him. You know, I got 10 hours. I should have touched max B about 30 minutes of those 10 hours. And when you truly talk to Tony Holler, like I do, I love the guy. We, we're speaking the same language. Just we, we speak it from different angles is all. Like I love speed. I absolutely love feed the cats. And I, I love everything about it. It is not a knock. I'm just saying, yes, lift the boat, but be stressing agility the whole time too. Unless you're track only. When I hear you talk about it, I kind of compare it to the bench press. If you want to build a big bench press, you have to bench press, but you have to spend twice as much time on your back to keep you yep. in those positions. So speed would be like the bench press and then change of direction. Agility comes into all your back work. So you're doing double yeah. the agility that you are speed work. And that is always say, I say for every ounce of speed, you better add two ounces of agility. And people are like, well, how do you do that? I said, well, on all our speed days, if it's two thirds speed, it's still one third agility at the end of the day. And then the next day is all agility. So now I've got a one and a third block, 133% versus 66%. Well, what's 66 times two? What is that? That's 120, 132. Okay. I was at two to one. You know, so I'm just like, if you spend 40 minutes on speed Monday, just spend 20 minutes of agility, teaching them to harness that speed. That could be your curve runs. That can be your stopping drills. That can be, it can be anything. Just teach them how to control it. Right. Right. Because you're not going to get them faster anymore. Like Tony Holler said, we all say it like you're just going to run them to death. So why not move them for 20 minutes after they get that speed dose? So then on the second day, you can work on like position training qualities, like teaching linemen how to have wide base shuffle fight. I mean, um, kick step, cross step. I mean, that's movement training to me, but people call it position training, teaching wide receivers how to attack angles and Attack 45, roll 90, come back down, wide base, step bases, crossing. People call that position training. I'm like, I'm just teaching them how to get off the line or run angle. You know, so it's, uh, you know, I, position training is, is, is taking a whole new meaning. And I think what's real wrong is now a lot of strength and conditioning coaches, but they're getting out of it, have been so enamored with speed. They're like, I'm just going to build this engine and then pass them off to their position coaches because they, they coach agility. I'm like, you just created an injury waiting to happen and an athlete that changes directions worse 
and pass them off to an agility coach. Like if y'all two aren't working together, you're 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 not doing the right thing. So I'll move into a little bit different of an arena in in coaching and what I saw down in Texas. So we were at the school. They bring in some of their own athletes. The athletes come in. They get to work with Tony Villani, you know. So they're they're pretty hyped up, but they're they're ready to show you how fast they are and what they have. And then it was like the more you worked with them and the more you tinkered with them, you could see the athlete soften. And it seemed like he was starting to bring in more of the information you were you were putting yep. out there. Do you notice that a lot? I mean, are you reading a lot of facial expressions and knowing when you're starting yeah. to break the surface? Yeah, because it's so hard. Everybody's like, oh, well, this works with pro athletes, but not young kids. I'm like, the younger you teach them, the better they are. Because I've trained some of the most elite athletes of the world after they're elite. And I'm telling you, they have the bad habits if they haven't learned game speed to decel the foot position to reacceleration. If they have not learned stuff in that order, they're doing stuff wrong. And I'm not saying they're not elite. They are, but they all can get better. But when you start with a 15, 16 year old, it just takes a while. Like you could, you saw it. Hey man, slow down. What do you mean? You're telling me to get time fast at this slow down. You know, let's move smooth and change directions fast. Right. There's a lot of setup that goes into the change of direction. There's not just change directions. And it does. It ta- You saw the kids. It takes a long time. And I was not frustrated at all. I thought the kids did great. And um, one coach came up to me and he's like, I'm so happy I watched you train those kids. Because when I try to use your principle on our kids, I, th- I thought I was doing something wrong. I was like, no, it probably took them two to three weeks to get it. He goes, yeah. After about three to four weeks, they got it. But the first day I was like, I'm coaching this wrong. I'm like, no, you're not. You saw it. Like it takes them time. This is the first time ever it's told this DN kid that's 16 and a great athlete. What even running an angle to 45 or rolling to 90 feels like. And that is a speed rush or a speed or a power rush, you know, like, and nobody's told them that. And all we're doing is working on three steps to 45 or three steps to 90. And trying to cut down angles and get from point A to B as fast as possible when his foot hits the plant. But nobody's taught him that. Not his D-line coach, not his speed coach, not his change of direction. Nobody's taught him that. So something that sounds so basic is like what we're talking about. Like so basic has just never been taught because people don't understand the importance of it or how much difference it makes. So it's hard. Like it, it, it that's in my curriculum is like it's 10 levels, but. First level is all speed and agility mechanics, phase one, phase two, phase three for speed, phase one, phase two, phase three for agility. And it's like 185 videos and and like, I don't know, two or three hours worth of content just to teach athletes to move correctly. Okay. And our pro athletes have to go through that first. Now, after you get through level one in our system, those drills become warm ups, right? And then it's like, hey, we warm up with some stuff, let you sprint fast and then move on. Right. But if you don't know how to move correctly, meaning sprint correctly fast and chain be in an appropriate change of directions positions when you want to change directions, you can't tell a kid or a pro, hey, run and change direction. Like none of that works. Run and change directions. OK, go be a drag race car and, and then all of a sudden change to a bumper car like it doesn't work. So you have to teach. I, I call it the order of game speed, D cell body position, foot position. Those four things all have an effect on how you change directions, just like stride length, stride frequency, power, and ground contact time. You mess with one of those in the wrong order, it can have a bad result. And I just don't think people have looked into the agility as much, but they're starting to, which is cool. When you're prepping guys for combine, you're dealing with a very elite athlete with a high training age. If you're a high school coach and you're trying to help your kid run a good 40 we talked about this earlier your your elite guys you're holding them back two weeks out but if you're dealing with a high school kid that doesn't have that training age can you push them a little closer to uh a combine where they're going to go to a school that they're going to be looked at can you push them a little closer to that date before you back off them i work with so many high school kids i just find it so hard to find a schedule for high school kids that they can truly improve their speed so when we're doing it for the combine we got everything so structured that we know they're only hitting speed and legs on the same date, Monday, Thursday. And we're kind of cutting a lot of the football load out and only letting them do football drills on Friday when I know they have Saturday and Sunday to rest. 
for a high school kid, I think, and I, that's what I've worked with, and 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 high school coaches that have a shred mill or don't have a shred, but are following like a feed the cats program, they try to sprint fast or with a shred mill do high intensity shred mill and legs, just two days a week, while the athlete's legs are the freshest they can be, and that's all you can do for a high school kid. That's it, and just fixing their schedule and their doses. Tony Holler, I keep uh, mentioning him, but he commented on one of my tweets like, yes, learning how to cook is better than the recipe, right? And, and that's what he means. Like, fix your schedule and your philosophy first. I went and spoke to a local school here for two hours because family friend, like these high school football coaches want to focus on speed and they really want you to come help them. And I'm like, all right, I've lived in this area for five to six years and they've known me, but yeah, I'll come do it, right? So everybody thinks like if I train NFL players, these high school coaches are going to listen. They don't listen to me either, right? So I go in there, and the track coach who's in charge of speed for football said, hey, I went to a Feed the Cats clinic. I really want to add it in. And I'm like, well, what'd you learn? He goes, "Uh, just that we're working too hard. I said, all right, let's look at your schedule. Gave me a schedule. I mean, it's typical. Lifting and jumping on boxing and conditioning like three days a week and football the other two days, right? I'm like, when do you have time to get fast? He's like, I don't know. So I started changing his schedule. I'm like, Monday, they should be the freshest. Let's take them out on the track. Let's do broad jumps. Let's do sprints and let's do sleds and then go in and do the legs. And then Wednesday, you got to kind of do a walkthrough day. So Thursday, we can do it again. Like, you, like if you try, it doesn't take much. Like, keep your same schedule Monday, Thursday. If you, yeah. So then I, I talked to a football player that goes to his team, you know, this year. Hey, what, what, tell me your schedule. They didn't change one damn thing. Not one damn thing. So there's no possible way these high school kids, most football players, are working out 10 hours a week with their high school football coach, and we can do anything to fix their speed. We can't. We got to have a good strength and conditioning at that coach, as at that school, that's trying to fight the uphill battle of telling the coach that, hey, your practice loads are two to three times more than that of your game. You know, and it's not our kids are out of shape. It's they're too tired going into their games. It, it's a constant battle. So with high school kids, I think the demands put on them by their schedule and parents and coaches almost eliminates them getting faster. But when we train a high school kid and monitor his schedule, and he is every bit as fast as every NFL player we train. It's not as big, but he's as fast. And that's when I go back to high school coaches. Just follow this simple schedule and your weight room does matter. Because if you follow this simple schedule that everyone's talking about, when I say everyone, anybody that knows anything about speed is telling you the secret and you won't listen to it, right? Follow this simple schedule of running fast twice a week and don't spend too much time on it, okay? That's the recipe, okay? Now, I mean, that's, yeah, that's learning to cook. Now, the recipe is what drills do you do for those 30 to 40 minutes? That's less, that's less important. Follow that simple way to make your athletes better. And you know what's going to happen. Your athletes will get faster. And you know what then matters? The weight room. Now that weight room matters. It's used as a strength and power engine for what you're doing when it matters. But until then, it's impossible with these high school kids, unfortunately. Obviously, you're getting tremendous results with the shred mill. I mean, it's doing exactly what it what you designed it to do, and it's getting shipped out over the country, and you're seeing more and more and more of them. But for the small schools or the little guy that cannot afford a shred mill, when they're using sleds, what are what are you looking for before the shred mill was invented? Are you looking at what body angle the sled is putting you in, or how are you utilizing a sled to make up that gap? So if you have a sled, right, the one thing I say, heavy sleds, like I didn't understand. I was kind of following – um acceleration profiling before it existed because i know less real well uh love the guy and um when he came out and was doing all the acceleration profiling I'm like, oh, yeah i got something else to learn now and he's like no no you're doing it you're just doing it your way i moved from sleds to shred mill because the shred mill luckily magically accelerated profiled for me but we do heavy sleds for 10 yards okay so what i do is i look at their like i teach them to push off the ground without a sled 
and try to get through seven yard or ten yards in seven to eight steps. Now, less powerful kids are going to take more steps. But I'm like, count your steps, okay? And if you start with your right foot, right foot back, count every time your right foot hits. So if it's one, two, three, four, that was four steps on your back leg. That magically means three steps on your front. That's seven steps, right? So I tell them just count their back foot. One, two, three, four. Are you through 10 yards? Okay, are you not? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Make sure you're pushing, okay? And then when we put a sled on their back, I never went heavy enough to take away that step distance. Now, what this did magically, which I didn't understand until now, is it made them stay on the ground and push harder. It slowed down their frequency. It slowed down their knee switch. But what was the goal with that heavy sled anyway? To increase your push and power. So it was. I was keeping their step rate, their step distance the same. But the only way to keep their step distance the same is they had to increase their ground contact time. Because they weren't going faster with a sled on their back, but they were pushing harder and staying on the ground harder to do it. And then I'd take the sled off of them and say, okay, now same push, knee switch faster, which means increase your frequency. Now you're going to go the same amount of steps in the same amount of distance, but you're going to hit the ground faster. And that was like acceleration profiling to me at 50% of their velocity decrement or whatever. But it was just a 10-yard sprint with a sled and a 10-yard get off without a sled maintaining the same stride line, right? And then what we did with lighter sleds is sometimes with no weight, especially if you're on field turf, if you're on field turf, that sled doesn't move too easy, you know? So we would do, if we're on field turf, we do a sled with no body weight and teach people how to run 25 yards with it and tell them to start feeling their heels and knees cycle, but feel as when they come up, they start to drop speed because there's a weight behind their back even if it's only 10, 15 pounds. And that it teaches that kid again, the importance of the transition and the top speed and not rising too soon. So we do heavy sleds, 10 yards, magical, you know, just try to see their steps on 10 yards, teach them their steps. And it sounds like hard to do, but it's not. You, you're trying to get through that. Just tell them to count their back foot. One, two, three, four means you got it through in seven steps. I mean, I'm nine yards and at four. Cool. Then you're going to go nine yards with the sled and four. Like just keep the same step distance with a heavy sled. If you can't keep the same step distance with a heavy sled, it's too heavy. And it magically made people go kind of lower than 50% of their velocity decrement. If you listen to less or others that less has taught to like less that make it up. Um, but they found that when you can't do it, it's like, well, too slow on the sleds is actually going to teach me to slow down. Yeah. That's why you're in the weight room. You're in that speed strength. Now, when you go to speed, let's be in speed power. If that makes sense. You start kind of getting down a Louis Simmons rabbit hole that he was down before he died with sleds and, and how he was using them. So I wonder with that, do you find there's kind of a perfect amount of weight on that sled that, that really gets the most force production out of them without slowing them down? Are you taking that weight up clear up until they almost drop a step? See, I'm a dummy because I created that thing called the shred mill and I haven't used a sled since 2016. Okay. But yeah, I was doing it with my eyes in 2016. If I wouldn't have created the shred mill and realized that it did it for us without me realizing what I did, um, I would have probably moved from sleds to 1080s, right? Like Les is doing. And the shred mill is basically a 1080 in place where you can pick the appropriate appropriate resistance to elicit a certain speed. So if your resistance is too high and you're less than 50% of your maximum velocity on a heavy load, you can adjust it. So um, I would have got into that with sleds and stuff. And I always thought like, why aren't people putting just making a sled with a simple GPS system on it that just reads what mile per hour you got to, you know, like I, that, I mean, that's someone else's invention if they take it, but like, just put like, I would love to have a sled with a speedometer on it. And at the end of every sled run, it told me what max speed they got to. It's really simple to do. I mean, they do it with GPS chip, but because that would be a way you could kind of just see how fast people are pulling sleds. What I do with people is if they don't have a shred mill or a 1080, I'm like, try to set up lasers, right? And if a kid's a 20 mile an hour athlete, that means he can get through a 10 yard fly in that magical, you know, one second about, right? 1.02 seconds, I think. 
So if we're doing a heavy sled, let them get a five yard head start with a heavy sled and measure the 10 yard fly. So a five yard and make sure he can do it in less than two seconds. Because now you just doubled his time. So you made him half as slow, right? And you just knew that if you can't do it in two seconds, that the sled's too heavy, you know? But before all that, I just did it on eyes and feel. Just look, that sled looks too heavy. He can't finish his push. He's too choppy. He's struggling. You know, I just did it by eyes and stuff. That's pretty enlightening because I've thought about that a lot of different ways. And I wasn't sure if I was heading in the right direction. But with what you just threw out there, you know, we have timers. We have sleds. We can make that work. And we can start figuring some stuff out from what blueprint you just threw out there. Yeah. And I was watching someone not argue. They were on Twitter. Everybody thinks Twitter is an argument. But, like, how do you time your kids every time you train them? And I'm like, I don't. Like, but I time them at the beginning, and then every once in a while I lay it out there. But, like, the more you time, I, I do think the better because it teaches a kid they're not going to just – it's life. It's, you're not going to just set PRs every single time, and it's a gradual increase. It's up and down. That's what tracking uh, – like what uh, – uh, what do they call it? Uh, USR. Record, rank, publish, right? Um, but it's like – you start to see the trends of movement, right? Me with combine guys, I don't have time to see a trend. I'm like, I got four to six weeks and I pick you apart and I try to pick the right thing to fix. And I want to track one thing one day because I can't, I'm training. Like I can't track everything. So I understand where people are like, well, I can't track every day. You shouldn't. But like on a pre-testing day, start trying to figure out maybe what loads they have to be on the sled. Just like you figure out what loads they have to be on a squat rack, right? Because if you spend time the first day and do that, then you could dose in something that's more appropriate to them for four weeks and never time them. But you know you're dosing something appropriate to them, you know, and then retime them four weeks later, you know. Now, sometimes if you don't take a deload period, like of a week, they're going to be slower. Like it's a plat, like guys, guys get better and then they go through, you call, it's a peak, right? And then they plateau and then they go to a valley. And they're in a valley when you're overloading them for four weeks. And then when you deload them one week, they come back up to their pretest. You deload them another week, they're at a new peak. You let them go run fast, they're at their PR ever, right? So you've got to make sure that you're, I call setting PRs as much about manipulating the schedule and setting them up the PR more than setting a PR, right? And that's all we're doing at the combine. Have we manipulated their schedule to set a PR at the combine? You know, get everybody faster. That's easy. Like everyone's going to get faster. I, that's what's crazy to me when two tenths of a second is, you know, is like that much. How does some of our guys just have a bad day and not get two tenths slower from their pretest? Like, but a bad day as us is still a tenth and a half of improvement. Like, there's everyone's getting faster. So, how much do you time up their PR if that makes sense? You're working through a super compensation model. You're trying to tax yeah. the CNS and then you're giving it a break and just slowly working it back up there where it does more than yep. it's ever done before. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's exactly what we're doing. And, you know, you call it and everyone calls it. What what does an exercise dose produce? A response. Okay, don't dose the same effing response you're going for while you're still waiting for the response. Let the response come and dose it again, you know? If they're a little tired but they're moving hard and moving fast, that's fine. You know, once when you deload them, they'll rebound. I mean, me and Matt freak out every year. Everybody's like, freaks out. How are you going to have the fa- you going to have the fastest guys again this year? I'm like, I guess do it like seven, eight years in a row. Like, I don't know. Like, but we freak out every year. This guy's not coming around, doesn't that? Just trust, just trust. His legs will come around. His legs will come around. You know, it happened with two guys this past year that had two of the best workouts that shocked everybody at Indy. I was freaking out all during training because how slow they were running. And I'm like asking Matt, like, like if I follow a, uh, an approach, maybe like Les would, I don't know Les's approach like that. It would be, man, we're overtraining this guy. We got to deload his volume because, and Matt won't let me No, We're hammering him today. You know, we're, we're, you know, they'll rebound, but then even Matt started down it. Have we hammered him too much? You know, but like both guys that I was worried about, like smoked it and, yeah, they were just came in pretty fast. And when we were overloading them, they got slower. Okay, they looked better. They felt more powerful. 
But they got slower. But when we started to load them, we said, first week, okay, they're back to their pre-test. Next week, ooh, they're even faster than their pre-test. Combine, oh my lord. Like, you could just see it, you know? And that's what I don't know if anyone's really, really figured out. I think if you talk to 10 Olympic track coaches, they're going to have 10 different peaking strategies, right? If you can ever figure out how to peak someone at the right time on that day for four seconds or 10 seconds, you figured out Pandora's box, you know? Or what do you do when they don't feel right? Oh, 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 I can't run Olympics. I can't run my 40 today. Can't do that, you know? So it's like, I don't like that. It sounds bad, the, the aura rings and the whoops and all that. I'm like, if we put those, and I'm different, because if I put those on my athletes while they're training, and they're used to feeling good with me. And then they go to the combine and they're staying up all night and they don't feel good on the day they got to run. And their whoop score tells them they're at 33 out of 100. You know what it's going to mentally do to that kid? It's going to crash him and ruin all his confidence that he's ever had going into that day. I'm like, dude, please don't wear whoops or aura rings while we train. Okay? Get your rest and listen to your body. Okay? But, I mean, I'm different. Maybe it's... It's lucky it works, but I don't know. That's what Bonnerchuk was trying to do in all of his system. He was trying to figure out the exact day they peaked and make that be, yeah. you know, whatever it needed to be, the Olympics, Pan American Games or whatever. So, yeah, there's yeah. a huge strategy involved, and you have to trust that that strategy is going to hold through so you don't do too much at the very yeah. end. It's so hard. Like, I would love to have guys – year round like some of these colleges and i talk a lot to some top colleges that own treadmills i'm like i'm so jealous of y'all you get all this data and see the ebbs and flows and i i don't i i have four to six weeks with a guy to figure out a puzzle and i really can't make a wrong decision with him after i put together his program because if i made a wrong decision i'm overloading the wrong thing for four weeks right because i got to wait for that response to happen you know you don't data is great and all that, uh, we got to train and get a physical response if we got six to eight weeks with them. And we need four to five weeks of hard training to do that. So, you know, everybody thinks we have it just figured out. Like, I'm like, oh, man, we're we're not guessing like everybody else, but we're, we're taking educated guesses with all of our clients every year also. The one thing that surprised me in Texas that I thought I picked up on, and maybe I did, maybe I didn't, I think we hang the interceptions on the quarterbacks too much. After watching all the footwork you were working with and all the things you were doing, it takes one misstep by a receiver, and now he can't shed the DB. The quarterback throws an interception. Well, he gets hung with that. Well, that wasn't his. That wasn't his interception. It definitely wasn't the quarterback's interception. Like when you listen to great quarterbacks, sometimes, and I was trying to get some lights on out here. I'm sorry. There we go. Uh, when you listen to great quarterbacks, sometimes that's when. The little saucy receiver that dances off the line gets phased out of the NFL real quick. Is when a quarterback drops back and sees that, and he's got 2.2 to 2.5 seconds to get rid of that ball. It's all the time. And you spend four-tenths of a second of that, 20% of that quarterback's time, to get into your route. That's one extra stutter step that you're not allowed to take. Right? And so a quarterback will look over there and just turn away. Right? But if that receiver is trying to do a move and move a DB over before he's just supposed to get to his spot in front of the guy, that's the receiver's fault. Yeah, so so much is on the receiver. And I would like to, I don't know, I would like to sit into, I've never been in an NFL locker room like that, but just see how much of the arguments happen on that week where the quarterback, like, you, you know Peyton Manning and, and Tom Brady, are giving it to the receivers. And you've heard the stories. Don't ever make me look bad again like that. Or I will never throw you another ball. Right? We tell all our receivers that dancing shit worked in college. It's not going to work in the NFL. You know, there's not, like, like it does work sometimes. I'm not saying it doesn't. But, like, the best receivers ever got from A to B as efficiently as possible and had the quarterback's trust. You know? So if you want to do it your way, your saucy way, fine. Also learn the efficient way because you're going to need both. In the efficient way, receivers are telling me they don't even want to touch the saucy way because it doesn't work. So we just try to convince the saucy way, I call it, the artistic way, the extra movement way. We try to tell them, do it your way. 
you got to also learn this because this is tried and proven for guys that play seven to 12 years, not guys that play one to three. Coach, you've been generous with your time, so I'll kind of wrap up here so you can have a little bit of your evening. But uh, the one thing that really jumped out at me down there was don't chase small numbers. When you're running, guys, yeah. don't you're not chasing hundreds. You're, you're looking for tents, and the only way to start gaining tents is to understand angles. So when did you quit chasing those small numbers? Uh, once when I realized that big speed gains was – improving four hundredths of a second and three 10 yard fly segments, right? So if I improve your 10 to 20 fly, 20 to 35, 30 to 40 fly, four hundredths, that's 0.12. And if I improved your start getting out good and the guy starting late attempt, I improved you 0.22. But I literally only improved you out of a start position that didn't matter and a fly time of four hundredths. Once when I realized that the greatest players in the world, when I told them they had to stop and change directions, were actually running slower than the guys that I was timing. I, I, I told great athletes, run fast and stop versus pro bowl athletes. And there was a definite definition in our room. Every There was six bona fide pro bowl players. It was like Travis Kelsey, peak Travis Kelsey four years ago. Mark Ingram, year eight, who was ending up in his peak. Denzel Ward, who was being great. A um, few other guys. Um, and a lot of other fast guys. We did a sprint test. Everybody on this 510 flight, everyone does. They, everyone was between 116 to 125. So everyone was within five or six hundredths of each other. Once when I told everybody to sprint and stop, the great players slow down the most. The most. But they stopped so much sooner. And Anquan Bolden had to point that out to me. He's like, you're mad because... Travis slowed down, what, an extra 300s more than the other tight end? Mark Ingram slowed down an extra 200s more than the other running backs? Denzel Ward slowed down an extra 400s than the other DBs? He said, but did you look where they're stopped, Tony? I said, no, I was just looking at the latest time. He goes, they stopped, and when they stopped, they were ready to move again. Everybody else stopped and was, like, out of control, right? And that stopping sooner in a better position is about a three to four-tenth difference. 10 versus slowing down an extra three to four hundreds. So I stopped chasing hundreds of speed in order to gain tenths of change of direction. Um, and it, it, it took me a while to learn how to explain that. And we're still doing it to every NFL group that comes in for the first time. We're still doing it when I go and consult NFL and college teams is I show them how little how little rate of return is a hundredth of speed and how much increasing that hundredth to two hundredths of speed eliminates in the game tents on a change of direction. And the coach and athlete have to see it. They have to see it that, oh my God, I just did that agility drill, that one change of direction. I did it three tenths faster. Yes. How'd you do it? I slowed down. Yes. Well, what happened? I got faster. Yes. They got to see it. They don't believe it. They're like, no, 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 no. I got to get faster. No, 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 no. Move smoother. You will be faster. Um, and you you sacrifice hundreds in speed for tenths in agility. So, and this is for football and soccer, like only. Sometimes you want those hundreds to stack on top of each other and track. I just say, and this is where people think me and Tony all argue, and we probably do. I think there is a certain speed that's fast enough. I just do, you know? And Tony Hall is going to say, no, push the threshold as much as you can. And I agree from where he's coming from. But I'm like, fast fast is fast enough. I got to focus on some other things. Coach, this has been a dream come true. I've, I've wanted to do this for a long time. I wasn't ready to ask these questions years back when I thought about it. But uh, tonight was great. I appreciate your time. No problem, Stephen. Thank you for the patience and everything because I just had to get done with the summer. But I, I greatly appreciate the platform. And uh you know, you can put my contact information. So if anyone has many questions, they can just email me or whatever, and I'll try to answer them. So, well, thank you very much. All right. Take care, Stephen. See you, man.